prayed for that during the day. I said yes to him, but even today, even this time of my life, it's even much more richer for me. Let's go to God in prayer. Any prayer requests, though, before we go to God in prayer tonight? Lord, it's still a prayer in this cabin, man. When I went to see him again, the devil told me to go back to that bed. Just come before you tonight as a body of believers, um, knowing that, Lord, when we pray, when we come together and we're in agreement in prayer, your good word says that, Father, you are in the midst of us. And our prayers, Lord, if they're according to your will and they're in your name, then they are yes and amen prayers. Yes, amen. And so, Father, we thank you that tonight, Jesus, we can uh, come into your presence together and just ask for you whatever we need. Lord, we do not receive because we do not ask, the Bible right. says. And so, Lord, if there's anyone tonight that's missing or lacking anything, I pray, Father, that you would uh, send your spirit uh, to intercede in their, in their hearts and their minds, Lord, to move them, provoke them, Lord, to call them out to you for what they need so that they would not lack anything. It's not, it doesn't bring you glory and honor when we lack something that we need. It doesn't bring you glory and honor when we do that. So, Father, tonight I pray that um, we would be a praying people. That was another thing I just kept thinking about when I was praying tonight, Lord, how great it would be just to be a church, Jesus, yeah. that just enjoyed, just worshiping, enjoyed, praying together, that it, it, we, we would find it so hard just to leave the presence of the Lord. Yes. There'd be nothing on TV or nothing Thank else you, to do, God, that would be more fun than just being Thank around you, your Father. people, just praying and worshiping together, Lord, and praying together and just fellowshipping together, Jesus, breaking bread together. That was your early church, God. Yes. We think, Lord, uh, church today, what we do on Sunday is church. This is not even, even what the early church looked like what we do on Sunday morning. God, I pray we would get back to that, yes. Lord, getting ready for your return, preparing our hearts and yes. our lives, Lord, for you to come back, Jesus. So, Father, I pray for Kevin, Lord. I pray that, uh, Lord, you would be with him and you can heal him, Lord. There's nothing too great. ALS is a, a bad disease, God, but Lord, even you're greater, more powerful yes, than that. You yes. can heal him even in that, Jesus. Yes. Oh, but God, pray that you would just encounter him. If he doesn't know you, that, that Lord, knowledge would come to him. The revelation, God, of your goodness and salvation, Lord, would come to him during this time. That you would use Frank, use Frank and Debbie's prayers as they pray in agreement together, asking you to heal him, God, asking you to save his soul if he's not saved in you, Jesus. And God, pray, Lord, for... Um, any need that went unmentioned tonight, Jesus, we pray, God, you would bless your people. Bless your people in abundance. We love you so much. Bless the teachers tonight. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, oh, deliver us from all the this. snot bugs. <laughs> I feel good today, man. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Thing 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 good. Thing good. Thing Give me some Tuesday and a little bit of caffeine. All those who drank some Tuesday. I'm trying to see. There's a whole different t-shirt. I'll drop a money night right now. Oh, man. Everybody's got uh, a little something, something going on. I apologize in advance. This is easy. Yeah. But um, it's so like God. Um, uh, I'm, I'm coming to you tonight, um, probably for the next couple weeks. Um, and I want to talk about it. It's interesting. Pastor brought it up. And um, again, it's so like God. Hold on for a second. My husband wanted to know if they were live streaming. That's how I'm sick. God is it? Okay. He's got what he's got. Um, Did you say dog is it? Yeah, he's just got a just got the group. Um, but I was um, uh, just wrestling with what um, to teach on tonight, and um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about you know one of pastors. I don't know if it's our mission, our vision, 
Um, but he talks about praying prevailing prayers. Um, you know, and he said, you know, he wants us to be a church that prays and church that worships. And that's really what God was speaking to me about, praying prevailing prayers. Um, if I asked you, you know, if we, if we were, you know, like you watch baseball, right? And they got a batting percentage, right? You know, that you see, if you watch in the World Series, this guy's like batting 283 in the postseason, right? It means every, he's batting 200, you know, 28% of the time he's getting on base, right? So if I were to ask you, how, how do you feel about your prayer life? What's your record with how many prayers that you prayed and you've gotten answered? Are you, are you happy with the results that you're getting from your prayer life? Right? That's a weird question, right? Right? Um, and, and if I'm honest, there's been some prayers that, you know, I've prayed that I haven't gotten the answer or, you know, and it, it's, it doesn't seem like, you know, maybe that I'm, I'm getting it. And, and we do understand, right, there, there are prayers that there is a right and a wrong way to pray. Do we, do you understand that? Yeah. Right? James says that you have not because you ask not. Right? You ask, an, a, a, you ask not. But he also says you ask amiss, right? And I think that there are some keys to prayer. The Bible is filled with promises to pray, is it not? Right? Ask, seek, knock, right? Keep asking, keep seeking. You know, you can say to this mountain, be removed, and it'll be cast into the sea, right? What else? What are some other promises of prayer? Anybody? Huh? Yeah. Healing, he's promised us healing. Knock and it'll, it'll be open unto you. Give you what you need. He'll give you what you need. He'll supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Right? But I think that there's a key to prayer. Um, and it's found in the 91st Psalm. And it is this idea of dwelling. 90, Psalm 91 and 1 states, He who dwells, in the secret place of the most high, the most high God shall abide on the shadow. All right, he who dwells in the secret place, and I've always tied this verse to John 15 and 4 because John 15 and 4 says, or 15 and 7, if you abide in me. And my words abide in you. What does it say? You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. I believe there's a direct connection between Psalm 91 and John 15 and 7. I believe those two scriptures are the key to praying a prayer that prevails. Right? It says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And I think that that key to that, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next couple of days. Today I want to talk about a little bit about what does it mean to dwell? What, what, do, what does it mean to dwell? He who dwells in the secret place. To live there. To linger. Okay. To, to, linger stay there. Yeah. to stay there. Yeah. To remain there. Okay? Yeah. That, that is, by definition... That's what it means. It means, um, let me back up for a second. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about, three weeks ago, we talked about our position, right? Our position is seated in Christ. We are in Christ. Can anybody take that away from us? Can we do anything to make that a reality? Who makes that, who puts us in Christ? Not us. Who puts us in Christ? By the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Hebrews says that we have the right to come in through the blood of the Lamb, right? The blood has made us righteous. The blood has covered us. We have the right to enter into the holiest of holies only by the blood of the Lamb. That's our position. We are seated in Christ in the heavenly places. I would encourage you to go home and look up the in Christ scriptures. There's quite a few of them, a lot of them even in the book of Ephesians. But that is our position. We are in Christ. Okay, that's, that's our position. We talked about our posture. And I believe that Psalm 91, this is our posture. I think it's this po having this posture of dwelling. So what, what does, in your, and so we, we talked about it, we said it means to remain, to, um, to stay, to linger. What does that look like to you in reality? To 
that you're caught up in just what's right there. There's nothing around you that's going to take your mind away from okay. So you're caught up? Yep. Pray. You pray without ceasing. You pray without ceasing? Ceasing. Um, maybe. Getting there, right? The dwelling, keep, keep, keep. It is, he who dwells in the secret place shall abide. He who dwells shall abide. You will not abide unless you first dwell. Do you see that? Yeah. There's a difference. The words are very similar, are they not? Dwell, but they're distinct. There is no abiding, abiding without dwelling. If we don't abide, we won't get what we ask for. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Yes. Right? Do you, does that, do, you, do you get that? So we got to understand what is this concept of dwelling? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Right? And, I, and, and when I think about dwelling, it means to remain. Um, but let me ask you this. How many of you ever, in your mind, just, when I, when I think about this, Debbie said it's like staying focused on something. How many of you ever dwelt on something, right, in your mind, yes, right? Do you understand what I'm saying, right? Where you're, where you're dwelling on something, and it could be something good, or it could be something bad. If, if, if we're, you know, honest, a lot of times we dwell on the wrong thing, do we not? Do we find ourselves dwelling on everything that's wrong instead of the one thing that's right? Do we find ourselves dwelling on what might happen instead of what we know to be true? Right? Do we find ourselves dwelling? And I think that this is the thing, is having that mind of Christ. Right? He says, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him, whose mind is focused on him. Right. So I believe that part of dwelling is having a mind that's focused on who he is. Right? It's having a mind where, you're, where your mind is focused on him. And we talked we talked about this in the intercessory prayer team a little bit on on um, Sunday morning, and I think that you know so often when we come to prayer, man, we just jump right into our list, right? We jump right into all the things that we need God to do for us, um, and then when He doesn't answer, we kind of like wonder where's He at? Yeah, because we haven't taken the time to dwell. I really believe there's something to taking the time to dwell. He who dwells in the secret place. My opinion, what dwelling is, is just taking the time to be with him. Um, and I think that that, you know, pastor said it, Isaiah 62 and 4 says that he delights in you. And, and I, he, pastor's right, this is what we have to understand is the depth of his love for us. You will never understand the depth of his love if you don't spend time. Not asking him, just taking the time to be with him. Yeah. Just taking, and this is a daily thing. This isn't like, oh, well, I, I think today I'll go. And this is part of our, you know, this should actually be the very first thing that we do in the morning. Before we start asking him for anything, before we start, you know, bombard, it is just taking the time to be with him. Put the cell phone away. I, I, love, I love my cell phone. I mean, everybody, we're anybody addicted to the cell phone? My husband laughs at me sometimes because I use the little find my phone feature on my watch because it'll ding, you know, and then I can find my phone. And um, he laughs at me, but I'm like, well, that's good because I don't have it around. But I don't need it because I have it right here on my wrist. <laughs> and if I don't have it on my wrist, I have it on my iPad, right? I'm all connected wherever I'm at. I've always got something yelling at me, that's right? right? Besides your husband? Uh, well, I didn't say that. You said that. Um, um, right? But I'm always connected. And this is probably the hardest thing for us to do. I've talked about it before. It's the hardest thing for us to do is to be still. That's true. Who has a hard time being still? You don't even have to have ADHD yeah. to yeah. have a hard time being still. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you, to me, that's what it means to dwell. It just means to be with him. Amen. And I think that, you know, I think about, Don and I have been married 39 years in April. Um, 
And there, there's, there's this place where you get, where sometimes you don't even have to say words, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Where there's just, there's just something, there's just something about being, right? Just, just to be in the room. I've spent a lot of time in the hospital, more times than I would like to, to um, more times than I think in three years I spent 12, 24, 32, 40 weeks in the hospital, I think at least another eight days, 40, 41 weeks in the hospital in three years. Um, and um, I had someone with me every night. There was not one night that I was alone. There were many days we didn't say a lot to each other. But there was just someone that was, it was just someone cared enough just to be with me. That's right. Right? Someone cared enough to just sit in the bed. They didn't have to talk to me. But they were there. Right? Every day, they were there. There's something about the presence of someone. Right? There's just something about knowing that someone wants to be with you. And can I tell you that someone is Jesus? I don't know what that does to you, but that humbles me. To know that I have free access, that I can just sit down with him. I don't have to say a word. I can just be still. And I am telling you, this is a practice. How many of you have ever done this? How many do this regularly? Can I encourage you to do it? Not for a minute. Not for, just, just do it. Five, start with five. You won't. You will, you, you will want to do it more. And what does this look like? It looks like just being with him. And this is, this is a time, honestly, where you just pour your love out on him. It is you just pouring your love out on him and letting him love you back. Because if there's anything that we need, it's to know that we are loved. He said it. We need to understand the depth of his love. You know how you understand the depth of his love? Is you let him love you. You get still long enough for him to love you. You get still and you empty your mind of everything except him. It's hard. It's hard. Right? But that's what dwelling is. It's no distractions. It's coming before him with no agenda with no distractions, with nothing but a heart of worship towards him. It's nothing with just saying, you know what, I just want to be with you. I don't, you don't have to say anything to me, but he will. Can I tell you, this is when he will speak to you. This is when he will tell you, you know what, I delight in you. This is when you will heal, when you will hear his assurance and his love for you, when you dwell with him. When you take the time just to be still with him. Mary of Bethany understood this, right? We know the story. Mary and Martha. He came and he sat down. Martha's busy in the kitchen. And Mary goes and sits down at his feet. Martha gets angry because Mary's not helping. Right? She rats out on Mary, right? She goes to Jesus. She gets like a little petulant little child. Jesus, Mary's not helping me. Make her come and help me. And what does Jesus tell her? Mary's chosen the one thing. She's chosen the best thing. This is just to be with him. Just you know, to sit with him. She should have thought about this. He's helping her. What she's doing to Jesus is helping her. You have to understand that, that the, yep. she wasn't washing the dishes physically. She was helping him. She was his help my sister. Help me. Yeah. So she could be with him. But that was Mary understood what it was to be with him. What it was to sit and listen to him. And then in John, before his burial, Mary was the one that washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She understood what it meant to dwell to remain in him, to stay focused on him. And David, pastor said it. He already preached my, taught my lesson. David understood what it is to dwell. Because David said it best in Psalm 27 and 4. 
there is one thing that I have desired. And that will I seek. Does anybody know what it is? That I might dwell, in dwell where? In the house of in the, the house Lord. Of the Lord. All, the days of my life. All the days of my life. To gaze upon his beauty. And to behold the beauty of the Lord. Hallelujah. And to inquire in his temple. Ask, let me ask you a question. Who likes to look at ugly things? I'm asking a question. <laughs> Who likes to look at ugly things? Right? We don't get excited about ugly things, do we? But David understood that there was beauty. That he's beautiful. Who likes to look at beautiful things? How many women love to go to the jewelry store? Look at the diamond bracelets. In the di the purses, right? <laughs> well, ugly things. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, we went to this we went to this um, jewelry store. I'm not a jewelry person, but we went to this jewelry store and it was Hawaiian jewelry, and I'm telling you, it was gorgeous. Um, but David understood what it was to behold the beauty of the Lord. And, I, and I, I tie those two together. That's why I think that that is the key to, to dwelling. He said, there's one thing I have desired. I want to dwell in his house and behold his beauty. You dwell to behold. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. When you dwell, you behold his beauty. It is nothing more complicated than that. It is, it is literally that simple. It is sitting before him. How many, of you, how many of you love to have someone tell you how good you look? I do. Right? We don't like it when someone tells we're looking frumpy or, you know, we're not looking good. My husband laughs because I work at home and um, some days I have my robe and my Yoda hoodie on and um, he doesn't always like it. Um, I can't say that it looks the best either, but I'm comfortable. Yeah. Right? Um, but we went on a cruise and we had formal night and I literally put on a dress the first time probably in a long time. That I wore a dress, and it was a long dress, and five inch heels, and um, I know, I know, I know, I have probably legs. Never seen you in a dress. Um, you've never seen me in a dress. You probably seen won't. Five inch heels. <laughs> um, I have pictures. To, I have pictures to prove it. It happened. It's um, gone right now. It's in the well, picture, Don. I got them. I'll show them to you. Um, but I was only in it for like an hour and a half. As soon as it was over, I took it off. See, my um, Put back, put on my jeans and stuff. Um, but you know, but but he said you you know he he complimented me right. He he was in a suit. I was in my dress. We all you know everybody was we we, we looked good. You know, I mean, and and, and the compliments were nice, right? Um, I don't know it was back there. I don't know who it was. It was a short it person. Last um, I couldn't see it. It was a short person. Yes. Um, but that's the that's the thing we. Oh, it was a little short. May was oh there. Oh May, short for it was um, right there. May. Oh, we might have been oh wow. <laughs> but the, to me, this is what dwelling is all about. It's taking time to tell him how beautiful he is. That seems weird, right? That seems like odd. It doesn't seem like anything, especially if you're a man. You know, you might have a hard time telling Jesus he's beautiful. <laughs> Um, but to me, this is what dwelling is. This is this is dwelling, and I think that we have to we have to understand. I, I believe that there is a key <laughs> that that is the key to pr praying a prevailing prayer is learning how to dwell in His presence. Um, and then, um, any questions on that? I know that that seems doesn't seem like I've said a lot, but I'm telling you, this is powerful. Because you have to take the time to be with him. I like to look at the clouds and sit there. I, yep. I'm a cloud person. Yep. I don't know why. Yep. I love nature. Um, so, talking about dwelling, um, being with him, no agenda, no distractions, no requests, just a desire to be with him, offering nothing but our worship. Can I tell you, I believe that this is how we minister to him. We 
were priests and were called to minister to him. And that is how we minister to him. By we, we, we worship him. We tell him how beautiful he is. We tell him how much we love him. Um, not after we've asked him for everything. Not as an afterthought. This has to be where we start. This has to be the place. This is the launching pad for everything. He who dwells in the secret place. Who, he who remains focused on him. Where? In the secret place. Who knows? Where, where is the secret place? Is it real? Do you think the secret place is a literal place? Yeah. Wherever you move it. It is. It's a literal place. The secret place is the place of his presence, right? He who dwells in the secret place, it's a literal place that you access it spiritually, okay? But it is a real place where he wouldn't tell us to dwell there, right? He who dwells in the secret place, and, and you see in Psalms 27 and 5, there, you see the, the scripture that the word secret place used a few times in scripture. Um, but in Psalm 27 and 4, we talked about one thing I have desired. David talked about dwelling and beholding his beauty. And then it says, for in the time of trouble, in verse 5, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. Now, what was the tabernacle? What was the tabernacle? Moses built the tabernacle. What was in the tabernacle? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented what? The presence of God. The presence of God. So, and, and David built a tabernacle. What did he put in the tabernacle? Hmm? He put the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, David brought the Ark of the Covenant back from Obed Edom's house. And where did he put it? In a tabernacle, right? So, so when he says that your secret place, you shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. Where is he hiding us? Holy place. He's hiding us in the holy place, right? He's hiding us in his presence. You, you got to understand that. The secret place is his presence. The secret place is where he is. He is where his presence is, right? Do, do you get that? We have access to the very throne room of heaven. And I don't, I don't know that I fully understand that yet, but, you know, pastors talk about it, Mays talk about it, I talk about it. You realize that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I belong around the throne. I belong in the Holy of Holies, right? At Calvary, when he died, it says the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. Right, that there, there was no way that any human could literally tear the curtains of the of the veil. So it, it was torn from the top and the bottom because they were too high for man to, to 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 tear them. Meaning that now full access is granted. There is no longer a veil between us and the presence of God. We have full access anytime you want to His presence. Does that does that do anything for you? Does, serious, does, that, does that excite you? That should excite you to know that there's nothing that separates you from his presence. Hallelujah. Right? There's nothing that separates you from his presence. And it says that in his presence there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand there's pleasures forevermore. Right? That in his presence, right, you understand that when you're with him you're in the presence of peace. You're in the presence of joy. You're in the presence of love. You're in the presence of power. And this is what David was saying. When you dwell with him, right? When you dwell with him, when you look upon his beauty, when you tell him how beautiful he is, that's what you're telling him. You're telling him how beautiful he is. And you're, you're, you're gaining entrance. You're actually going to the place where he is. And I think that so often we want him to come down and meet with us down here. And he will lift us up, but he will never live down here. You understand that? We're never meant to live down here. We're always meant to live 
up there with him. You know, does, does that make sense? Yes. Right? The, the world it says this world is not my home. The Bible, you know what the Bible actually calls us? Calls us aliens. Right? A foreigner. We're strangers here. We, we, we've pitched our tent and we've built our home here where this world is not our home. We're very comfortable down here. Where you know where we should be more comfortable? We've got it reversed. We're very comfortable in the earthly realm. And we're not very comfortable in the heavenly realm. Right? We have a hard time believing that I belong there. And we need to get more comfortable. Pastor said it. We need to get more comfortable with being up here. And he said it. And down here, things just don't satisfy. Things of this earth, they just don't satisfy. Right? I don't find the satisfaction in, in watching certain things or doing certain things, right? Because my soul is crying out for beauty, and he's the only true beauty. Do you understand that? Yes. Does that make sense? And we become too attached to the things of the world. We, we spend so much time on things that don't matter. And when we stand before him and we give an account for our time, you know, because people will tell you, I just don't have time, right? Time is the one thing that you do have. Time is the one thing that you can control. Do you, do you know who has control over your calendar? You. You have control over your calendar. And I get it. We all have demands on our time. If you work for an employer, if you're not self-employed, and even if you are self-employed, um, there's demands on your time. Yes. Right? BMO Harris Bank tells me that I have to be at my desk from 8 to 4.30 every day. I don't always do it. <laughs> <laughs> what they don't know, I'll get them. You're out of time. Um, I don't care. Um, I've worked so many hours know, over right? Naomi about five years of my life. Um, but that's what, but I, I have an obligation, right? I get, I get a little deposit in my account every two weeks, and it's for something that I need to give to them, right? But I have control over the rest of my day. I have control over how long I sleep, how long I play, how much I watch TV, how much I eat, what I, what, my time is mine. And if I don't make time, I have nobody to blame but myself. And, 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 and that's what David understood is that, you know, Pastor said it. He understood what it was to, to know his love because he knows that when you're in his presence, you're in, you're in love, right? We talk about being in love. Do you realize that when you're with him, you are literally in love? When you are in Christ, you're seated in Christ, you're seated in love. Right? You're seated in love. And isn't that, at the end of the day, what we all want? Is just to know that somebody loves us. Just to know that someone loves us. And so often we look at that, again, from people, and we fail us. And we fail them. But all the time, love is waiting. And can I tell you, when you sit in love, you will love everybody else better. Right? When you're grounded, when you're seated in love, you will love others the way he expects you to love them. You can't give something you haven't first received. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? So that's that place of dwelling is that place of just taking the time to be with him um, and telling him how beautiful you are. <coughs> telling him how much he means to us. Telling him who he is to us. Right? And, and going back to, you know, that this, this call to come up here, and I, I, I don't know how else to say it except how to convey it. And that's what I, my prayer was. God, help me and help 
me to convey and help them to understand and get the revelation that he wants to be. More than anything else, he desires your presence. He doesn't ask anything from you. Nothing that you do is based on what you can do because he's already done it. And I think that that's what we have to understand. I bring nothing. To, there is nothing that I can bring to the table that is going to change anything mm -hmm. except my love and my worship. Do you understand? He's not asking anything of me that I can't give. The only thing that I can give him is my pure heart, my unadulterated worship. And that's what I bring to the table. And that's always his call is to come up here. Right? Come up here. Come. Come to me. Come up here. Don't stay down there. Um, and we'll talk, I was going to talk about the table of the Lord, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but talking about the beauty, and we're going to practice this, because I just feel like that this is what we need to do, um, is practice it. Um, and we're going to take a few moments, and we're just going to sit in his presence, and we're going to tell him how beautiful he is. And we're going to do it hopefully long enough to we sense his presence, he's here. But when you think about him, he is beautiful. He is beautiful. Um, when you think about his goodness, think about the beauty of his goodness. Has he ever been good to you? Yeah. Has he been good to you? Yeah. Think about his majesty and his splendor. It's not hard. We could spend hours thinking on his beauty and his majesty and his splendor. Pauline said, I go outside and I look at this night sky. I look at the clouds. I don't know about you, but I get lost in the galaxies. I can't even comprehend the speed of light and the speed of sound and how far galaxies are and how big things are. And you know, how, how many golf balls could sit, you know, whatever. You know, you, you, Louis Giglio is all about that, right? Because the massiveness, right? Galaxies that we haven't even d discovered yet. And that's the awesomeness of God. And he says he knows every star by name. He speaks and galaxies are born. And every star has a name and he knows it. That's how beautiful he is, right? Is he great? He's great, isn't he? Yes. More than what we say at our dinner, God is great. But it's his greatness. The beauty of his perfection. He's perfect. The word says that he's perfect in all of his ways. Right? Some people think we're perfect, but we're not. But he is. The beauty of his strength. There's nothing that he can't do. And the beauty of creation we talked about, the beauty of his glory, and the beauty of his voice, the beauty of his peace, the beauty of his self-existence. Just think about it. He didn't need anybody to make him beyond comprehension. But that's who he is. His self-sufficiency, he has need of nothing. If he doesn't need anything, then is there anything that I need that he doesn't have? Every need he can supply because he is all-sufficient. He's eternal. He's infinite. He's unchangeable. He's all-knowing. He's all-wise. He's all-powerful. He's transcendent. There's nobody greater than he is. 
He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, all the time. You think about Hagar. When she fled to the wilderness, because Sarah was angry at her, and she sat there and she felt the love. And the angel visited her and said, hey, you're, you're going to go back. Pick yourself up. You're going to go back and you're going to have a child. And this child's going to be a nation. And she said, she named that place that this is the Lord who sees me. Because he's everywhere. All the time. And you're never outside of his gaze. The beauty of his faithfulness. Has he ever failed you? Has he ever failed? He cannot fail. The beauty of his justice, the beauty of his mercy, the beauty of his grace, the beauty of his love, the beauty of his sovereignty. That's who he is. That's worthy. We could, we could think about that. For a long time. And then you can go to the book of Revelation. And it's interesting that David said, I want to behold his beauty because you know what Isaiah said? Isaiah said he's really not anything to look at. <laughs> right? I, that's what Isaiah said. Not really all that in a bag of chips like Johnny Bravo. But his nature is beautiful. His nature is beautiful. And there really is very little in the Bible that describes Christ and the Father. But John the Revelator does. And I was listening to someone the other day. And um, I guess I never thought about this. Can you imagine that when John the Revelator was on the Isle of Patmos and he got to see Jesus in heaven, do you realize that he saw the one that he walked with? Mm. Have you ever thought of it that way? He saw the one that he walked with. He laid on his chest. He saw him crucified. He witnessed his resurrection. And he saw him ascend into heaven. And now he's in prison and he gets to look on the one that died for him. And he got to see a vision of him. I don't, I don't know. But this is what he said. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. And he said he saw the Son of Man clothed. He's clothed with the garment down to the feet. And he's girded about the chest with the golden band. Picture this. I have no imagination. But this is the best description we have of Jesus, the Son of Man. His head and hair were white, like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace, in his voice as the sound of many waters, the beauty of his voice. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Do you get a picture of what he looks like? It's pretty radiant. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying, Don't be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives, and I was dead. But behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell and of death. That's the Son of Man. That's probably the only, Ezekiel 1 has another description, but that's literally the only description of Jesus that you'll find. But meditate on that. Because that sounds like that's pretty amazing. And then you can read in four, it talks about a little bit, it gives about the throne room of heaven and about the Father, but it doesn't say much about uh, the Father either, um, but it just it describes the throne. There was a jasper and sardius stone in appearance, 
And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Um, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightning, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and back. And they say day and night, holy, holy, holy. That's the place that we belong. That's the place where we should be. That's the place where we should want to be. That's the place that we belong. Do you get it? He who dwells where? In the secret place. Where his presence is. That's where we dwell in. In the place where there's a throne with 24 thrones and 24 elders sitting on that throne with creatures that are full of eyes circling the throne, crying, holy, holy, holy. And it says they get a glimpse and they cry, holy, 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 and the elders bow down and they cast their crown at his feet. And they go for another spin and they get another glimpse. And I heard one minister say that they sing, holy, 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 because he's infinite and the depth of his majesty is so great. That every time they get a glimpse of him and get it, they're filled with eyes and they can't stand to see his beauty. And all they can do is bow down and worship. That's what it is to dwell in him. That's the place that we belong. That's where he wants us to be. Because if we dwell, then we abide under his shadow. And we're going to talk about that next week, the shadow being a place of protection. When you abide under his shadow, you're protected. And that's a promise. But you'll never get to the place of abiding if you don't first learn to dwell. You guys ready to dwell? Give me five. I will play as long as you want to. Separate yourself, do whatever you want. We're just going to tell him how beautiful he is. Find, find a quiet place. Find a place where you're not distracted.
Start your day, 5, 10, 15 minutes, just sitting before it. It will change your day because that will get us to the place of abiding. I've heard Pauline said that place of abiding is that place of, of praying without ceasing, right? The dwelling gets us to the place of abiding. And that abiding is that place where he is the one that consumes your thoughts. What do you think about when you do dishes? I don't, I don't do dishes, so I have to think. I don't do dishes. <laughs> but I do. Right. But have you ever thought about what you think about when you're not in your prayer time? Because... You know, one thing Jesus never did, he never told his disciples to have a quiet time. Do you understand that? He never told them to have a quiet time. You don't see quiet time in scripture. You see dwelling in the secret place. Mm -hmm. That's a difference. There, there's a difference, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference. And it, 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 it's not beyond me that out of all the things that the disciples saw Jesus do, what is the one thing that they asked him to teach them? He understood what it was to be in the secret place. He understood what it was to stay connected. And I believe that that abiding is that place where we're driving, we're whispering those prayers to him, right? Because when, when, when something comes up, and we don't have to fight to get to there, we're, we have that that portal, we have that direct communication because we're, we're remaining in the secret place. And he's the one that consumes our thoughts. And when someone ticks us off, our first thought isn't what we want to do to them. The first thought is, but he's good, <laughs> right? Yes. He, he, he's, he's, he's still working, right? When something doesn't get right, when something goes wrong, I run to him, right? I'm already there. And I'm just calling out to him. And I'm I'm right there. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a game changer. I'm done. I'm done. Sorry, brother. Oh, I apologize to the bench. What do you apologize I thought I stepped on Frank's foot. He's got big feet. You know, when I walked out of there, 